Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Join us for the month of September as John Strand preaches his four-part series, Jesus Frees Us. It was back in the, um, the spring of 1983, and I was at Bible College down in the States, way down in the States. And uh, we we're having a pastor's conference at the Bible College, and there was lots of pastors there and lots of students and we would join together in services something like this, pastors and students, as we worship the Lord during the day. And one particular um, chapel service, we're all gathered together, pastors and students alike, and I was sitting there. And remember, I was quite shy. And uh, someone stood up in the chapel and said, there's someone here that needs to say something to Jesus, about Jesus, about their life. And I thought, well, there must be somebody else to say something, because there always is in a crowd of pastors and students someone's gonna pop up and say something but nobody did and I thought well maybe it should be me I said no it's not me at all it wouldn't be me and so he went on to worship and then after another song the person stood up again and said there's someone here that needs to say a word for Jesus and if they do their life will be blessed their life will be blessed and nobody stood up so I said I guess it's me so I stood up. I said, Lord, here I am. Here I am. So I stood up, much like I'm standing up here today, and I told them a story about my life in Christ, briefly. And after it was over, one of the staff members said to me, after the service was over, he said, there's someone here who wants to meet you. And guess who it was? It was Pastor Jeremy Mahood. There he was. I met him for the first time. And he said, John, would you consider working with us for the summer up at All Nations Church in Sudbury? And I says, yes, here I am. And that was a pivotal moment in my life. I stood up at the call of the Lord in all my weakness and all my trembling. And I said, Lord, here I am. And my life changed. I came to All Nations Church. I came to Sudbury. And my life was blessed and has been blessed. It has been blessed with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, with the love of Jeremy and his family, and of course his cousin, especially. <laughs> that was the biggest thing. But my life was blessed with two children, and the Lord is continuing to bless me because I am in the situation where he has called me to. I believe that with all my heart. And we also are in a position here today to which... Jesus Christ has called us to, to be here at All Nations Church, to carry on the legacy of Jeremy Mahood, who God used to build this beautiful edifice, to, to build into our lives the work and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. And now he says, it's up to us to carry it on, isn't it? Jeremy's work is done. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for the love. And, and, <laughs> and the heart. it was hard. It wasn't easy. But he had love in his heart, and he had the Lord by his side to lead him and guide him, to build this beautiful work together. And this is just the beginning. Amen? Amen? This is just the beginning of what the Lord has for us here in Sudbury and the North. Let's pray together as we say to the Lord this morning, Here I am. Here I am. Thank you, Lord, for all you're doing in our life at All Nations Church. Thank you that your love is real. Your calling upon our hearts and lives is real. We're called to serve you in freedom and we're called to serve you in joy speak to us lord deep into our hearts this is the only moment we have and this is the moment we surrender to you in jesus name we pray amen jesus gives us freedom to serve step three in our journey to the heart of jesus jesus calls us to serve in freedom and joy and he says take my yoke upon you what happened what happened to the sons and daughters of god what happened to me? Why aren't we serving in freedom and joy? What are we doing? In times past, I would say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve the Lord even if I have to hit you on the head with the Bible. It's a big, heavy book. 
I can give it to you. Throw the book at you. And I've been there. I've been that legalistic type of personality. And it doesn't help very much, does it? And now I believe in grace and I believe in love and I, I believe in the attractiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ living in us, working through us. So what happened? We were afraid like Moses. The Lord appeared to him in the burning bush. He says, here I am, Lord. And then afterwards he says, you know, maybe you consider some, sending somebody else. Send someone else. I can't speak. I'm shy. I'm afraid. You know, I, what are they, they going to say? Like, who is it that's backing you up? Who is it that's, that you're speaking for? And he was, he was a basket case. He was afraid. And the Lord was a little bit, you know, he wasn't quite as happy with Moses at that time that he should have been, I suppose. But Moses um, got his brother to help him. And the Lord says, well, what about Aaron? He'll help you. He'll help you to speak, and I'm sending you together to speak to the people on my behalf. But he said, please, someone else. The great Moses afraid of rejection. And we have the same fear living in us. What can I offer? What is it that I can offer to the Lord? What is it that he wants of me? I really am not a great speaker. You know, you don't have to be a speaker. You can just be someone who's out there. Even if it's peeling the perfect potato, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as we do it unto the Lord. Isn't that the truth? I was a very afraid of public speaking. I was the kid in class, sit at the back of the class, with my head right down. Literally, I'm not kidding. I had my head, I was at the back of this class, with my head down on the desk. I was scared to death of even muttering a peep in class. I was so painfully shy, and people would say, John, you know, you're your own worst enemy. And I felt it. I felt, man, I'm really messed up. But the Lord helped me. And my, my greatest weakness in the Lord has given me strength to speak. Now, I'm up here because of the Lord Jesus Christ, not because of the strength I have. I don't have any strength. You know, we're afraid. We're afraid, like Moses. And they, we say, please, send, there must be somebody else that can do a better job. And I've said that. I said, you know, there must be someone else to do a better job. The Lord taps you on the shoulder and said, no, no, it's you. I'm sending you. I'm going to use you. Okay, here I am. And what happens? We overcome fear with joy. We discover there is joy in serving. Moses went from fear to joy. After the people of Israel came out of the bondage of slavery to Pharaoh, they were going across the Red Sea, as you know, and the Lord parted the waters, and Moses and the people went forward. And then we all know what happened. The waters came together, and the forces of Pharaoh were destroyed. And this is the song that Moses sang in Exodus 15 and 1. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for his highly exalted, the horse and the rider he has hurled into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He went from fear to a song of worship and praise because he said, here I am, Lord, in all my fear and all my trembling, I will do my best to serve you. And the Lord honored that. And he saw the mighty handiwork of, of God. He saw that the Lord came through and he began to sing and worship because he saw that the Lord was real. And we do the same when we stand and say, Lord, here I am in whatever capacity he's called you to. And we put our hands, trembling as they might be, into the hands of the Lord. He comes through. And we see the beautiful working of his spirit in our life and the life of others. And we rejoice because he is real. He is real. There is no fear in love. And you know, my, uh, one of my favorite poems that my father-in-law, Bert McGee, shared with me, one of his favorites, went like, goes like this. Every time I get up to speak, I say it. And it's, say a word for Jesus, and if your faith be dim, stand in all your weakness and leave the rest to him. Amen. That's what Bert told me, and it stayed with me. It's good that when your father-in-law tells you something, you remember it, isn't it? It's good. <laughs> so we are called to serve in freedom and joy, not in pain and agony, not in you know, I got to do this. You know, I don't really want to do it. We're called to serve in freedom and joy, to free ourselves to serve. There's freedom in Christ. And if we're not free in our serving, we need to reconsider. We need to reconsider our area of service, reconsider where the Lord would have us. Where's the best place for us to be so we might be free 
and experience the joy of the Lord. That's so important. Well, the first thing we do is we pray. When I went to Norway, my home country, they had me back. That's okay. <laughs> they said, okay, John, for, just for a while, though. Anyway, the first thing they say in Norway, first, we must have coffee. We say the same thing, don't we? Where's my Timmy's? I can't do a thing without my Timmy's. I'm, I, you know, I'm well known for Timmy's. But, you know, the first thing that we have to say and do is pray. First thing we do is pray, like Jesus in Mark 1.35. Early in the morning, he went out from the house, went to a desolate place, and prayed. First thing in the morning. That's what he did. And he said, you know, I, my father and I are one. I can do nothing without my father. I can do nothing without my heavenly father. He was so close to the father, his ministry came out of the heart of his heavenly father. The two were one. And out of that oneness came a beautiful ministry, healing and salvation. Like my friend in Bible college, Peter Rauschenbach, every morning at five o'clock, he got up to pray. He went away for two hours and he came back. He woke me up at five. And when he came back, he woke me up at seven. And he said, John, I've just been with the Lord for two hours and I've read the Bible and, and I've prayed and I feel so blessed by his presence. I feel so beautiful. I said, okay, Peter, sure, whatever. <laughs> but I, re and I wasn't that great at getting up in the morning. It may not be the morning is the best time for you, but Jesus did it. Peter did it. I am attempting to do it in the morning. I'm getting up at 6, not 5, at 6. Read my Bible, have my coffee, and I consider the Lord Jesus Christ. I consider him. We can do nothing without prayer. Prayer is a heart's cry for Jesus. Psalm 42 and 1 says, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul pants for you. Oh my God. You see, something is missing unless we connect with the Lord Jesus Christ. Something is missing in our life. You know, our relationship with Christ defines us. Unless we seek Him with our whole heart, we don't know who we are. We have no idea who we are unless we present ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ and we say, Lord, speak to me. Your servant is here. I am here to listen, speak, and His love begins to define us. You know, it means that Jesus is our source and our strength. Have you ever seen a compass? You don't need one, I know. You're northern people. You, can, you, you have a great sense of direction. But I have a compass, and it points to true north. Of course, that's Sudbury, isn't it? This is true north. That's where I come. I come to the true north. That's where I feel my home is. But in the same way, our compass, when we look at it, the compass of our life should point to Jesus Christ. True north. True to Jesus. True to our heart. True to reality, Jesus Christ is our center. We look at our compass of our life. We point it to Jesus Christ. We say, Lord, you are our everything. I need you. I love you. Speak to me. So as we pray and as we seek the Lord, whatever time is convenient. But you know, we don't always have to talk and tell him everything, although we do owe him our burdens. But we need to listen to him. To listen, what is it that you're saying to us, Lord? Tell me beautiful things. Tell me something original and creative and, and show me the way. We just have to be there and direct our heart towards him. And what happens? What happens when we pray to the Lord Jesus Christ? When we receive his love. The first thing he does is show us his love. Showing us his presence. He calls us to himself. He shows us his love. He shows us his presence. If you go before the Lord and something else happens then forget it. He gives you love. This is what he gives you. He lifts you up. He gives you love. He gives you his love, his forgiveness. He gives you his redemption. He doesn't put you down. He does not do that. That's not the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't devise ingenious traps to get you all messed up so you can be broken in life. He doesn't do that. That's what the world does. That we do that to ourselves. And there's lots of people that are quite willing to come in and put the hammer down. And that's why we need to pray first, because he will lift us up. He is the glory and the lifter of our heads. That's who he is. Listen to him. We need to listen to that voice. Quit putting yourself down. Quit doing that. The Lord doesn't say <laughs> he's not doing that to you. We do it to ourselves. We're our own worst enemy. We put ourselves down. He doesn't do that. Jesus lifts us up and shows us love. That's who he is. Do you believe it? 
If you believe, he's the one that's going to lift your head. Listen to his voice. My sheep hear my voice, the voice of love, the tender shepherd lifting us, lifting us, loving us, showing us a better way, showing us the open door to heaven, the open door of his heart. We need to work and come into that beautiful heart of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we pray. And he looks into our heart and he pours into our heart beautiful gifts. We realize we are gifted. We receive gifts of the Spirit, which become embedded in our spirit. Peace, love, and joy, long-suffering. All these things are given to us as we pray to the Lord. He blesses us, the two-way channel. We give him our burdens. He gives us his peace and his love. First, he loves us. We are his children. And we build our lives in this fact. And he uniquely gifts us to the task that we have. He's given us unique gifts. That's why it's so important to seek him and ask him, Lord, what are my gifts? You know, what have you done in my life? And sometimes the, we judge ourselves and say we don't really have anything. We quickly just deny what God is placing in our lives. But you have gifts, each and every one of you. Each and every one of you have unique gifts that God has placed in your life that he means to use. And you say, you look at yourself and you say, you know, maybe there's nothing really there. But there is something there. As we pray and worship, he will illuminate that in our lives. And we're meant to use that for his glory. And that's why how we can be free, because he uses the gifts that are unique to us, already there. And he touches them. He says, this is something you can use. This is something you can do. Even if it means that it's a simple thing like peeling the perfect potato. It's enough as long as we do it to the Lord. As long as we do it unto the Lord. I used to, I work in construction still. I'm a carpenter. And um, one day there was this guy after work, a tradesman, picking up garbage around the site. And I said to the boss, what's that guy doing picking up garbage? Don't you have someone that's, you know, paid to do that? I thought he was a plumber. What's he doing picking up garbage? And the boss says, well, you know, that guy's a Christian. Oh, yeah, he's just picking up garbage because that's the way he serves his Lord. Anyway, that's what he told me. And so he was going around the site picking up garbage and cleaning up. And it was providing a powerful witness to those who would see him doing that, picking up garbage, and smiling as he was doing it. Imagine, he was serving with joy. And that was enough. And the Lord says, if you give only a cup of water... In my name, you'll not lose your reward. It just takes a little, even a cup of water here. In the name of Christ, I'm giving you water. And he gives us living water, doesn't he? We can pour that life out, that love out. Living water, he gives us. So, pray. And as we pray, as we make him the true compass, the true north of our life, he will touch us. Amen? He's done that with me. He showed me stuff, and he's still showing me stuff. As we pray and touch the hem of his garment, he reaches down and loves us. This is who he is, and gives us love. And we're meant to pass it on. We're meant to pass it on. We're meant to give it. I don't know if you've heard this quote. A bell is not a bell until you ring it. A song is not a song until you sing it. Love in your heart is not put there to stay. Love is not love until you give it away. Jesus gave his love away, didn't he? All of it on the cross. And he calls us to give our love away. And in doing so, we become free. We become free. And those who are free in Christ are free indeed. Pray. Realize we are gifted. And take upon us the yoke of Jesus Christ. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How can that be so? How can that be so? Because he knows what it is to be religious. He knows what it is to do all these things. And there's never enough time to do all the stuff we have to do. Besides save the world, basically. That's on our shoulders, right? To save the world. And the burden of religion can be great. And that's why he said, take my yoke upon you. Not religion. But him personally, he's going to... You know, he was a carpenter too. And he worked in the carpenter shop till he was 30 years of age with his father, Joseph. And you know, there could have been a sign above the carpenter shop 
that said, my yoke is easy. Because back then, you know, being a carpenter meant you had to build yokes for oxen. Isn't it true? So he said, on his carpenter shop, perhaps, I didn't see it, I wasn't there, but I'm just thinking. <laughs> my yoke is easy, right? My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So he would, he would take the yoke, people would bring the oxen in, and um, the reason that his yoke could be easy was because he carved it to fit the shoulders of the oxen so that it, they wouldn't chafe or cause blisters. So that's why his yoke was easy. And the yoke he has for us is the same. It's custom tailored to us so that it wouldn't chafe, it wouldn't be a burden, it wouldn't cripple us. Sometimes the burden we take on in life cripples us. Jesus says, let me take that burden off your back and let me put my easy yoke on your shoulder. I don't know if you heard the story about uh, Derek Redmond. He was an Olympic athlete back in 1992. He was in Barcelona, a British athlete, and he was going to run the 400 meters. And halfway through, he had an agonizing pain in his leg. Something happened, and he fell to the ground. He tore his hamstring, and he fell to the ground, and his Olympic hopes were dashed, having trained and trained and trained to do this event. And he fell to the ground, and he got up. And he realized he wasn't going to make it. He wasn't going to make it. His hamstring was done. So he got up and started to limp. He started to limp towards the finish line. And his father was in the stands. And his father says, he yells out. His father, he sees his son limping down the track. He says, that's my son. That's my son. And so <laughs> what does the father do? He gets up out of his seat, goes through security, gets on the track, and puts his arm around his son. And helps him across the finish line. He is yoked with his son. Together they cross the finish line. He wasn't going to make it without his father helping him, was he? And as they crossed the finish line, 65,000 people rose up in their seats and applauded father and son. A beautiful moment in Olympic history. So you see, when the Heavenly Father sees you struggling, when he sees that he are not going to make it across the finish line, what does he do? He sends his son. He comes to you in the face of Jesus Christ. He comes to you in the life and the surrender of his son. He sends his son into the arena to yoke himself with you that you would finish the race. And the only way you're going to finish is with Jesus Christ helping you across. It's the only way to finish the race of this life is to yoke ourselves with Jesus Christ. You see, the yoke that Jesus tailors to us is a double yoke. It fits him, and it fits us. He yokes himself with us, that we'd cross the finish line together, that we, without him, would not be able to do it. We find ourselves lost in his love. We find the yoke around our shoulders. We're yoked to Jesus Christ. We serve in freedom because we are freed by his love. And we give that love away. Love is not meant there to stay. Love is not love until you give it away. And we find that <laughs> Jesus Christ is helping us in our life. He's there beside us. Sometimes we don't feel it. It doesn't matter. He's still there. He doesn't base his, he doesn't base his ministry to us on feelings alone, although they're there. They're important. Even if we're feeling rotten and rough, he's there in the yoke with us, pulling us forward. He's going to get us there despite what we do. Nothing can keep us from his hand. Nothing can keep us from the finish line. We may be broken and wounded and in pain. That will not stop us. We're going to get there because of Jesus Christ. Amen? We're going to get there because of him. He were double yoked with Jesus Christ. He's going to bring us across the finish line to the cheers of heaven. And all of heaven will sing glory to the risen king. Well done, thou good and faithful servant, because you have yoked yourself with Jesus. We serve in freedom because we are freed by his love, and we give that love away. And Jesus is yoked with us. I'm just going to pause here before we prepare for communion. And I'm going to ask that you open your hearts to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not hard to serve him. No, really not. It's not hard. It's not, it's not a horrible burden. He takes the burden of religion off of us, 
and he offers us his very presence, his very essence, and his love. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, that you love us. Thank you, Lord, that your love is uncommon. We, don't, we haven't really encountered this kind of love. We look for it in others, Lord. We look for it in other people, but it's just not there. It's only in you. And that's why we surrender to you, Lord, because you love us. Your love is deeper, longer, wider. Love your children, Lord, today. Help them to see. Break through our hearts and minds, Lord, so we would see how much you love us. Break through by your spirit and feed us with that incredible love. It's the only thing that will sustain us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now, I'm just going to briefly talk about the images of service. So this will stay in your mind. The first one is the yoke. As we prepare for communion, as we prayer, prepare our hearts for communion, the first thing is the yoke. It's the yoke. And at one time, the yoke was a yoke of slavery. We throw that yoke away. We take on the yoke of Christ. And the yoke of Christ means that we're never going to be alone. We can't do it alone, and we're never going to be alone. And then we have the towel. Jesus washed his disciples' feet. He used the towel. He got down and washed their feet. My mom used to wash my feet for good reason. But Jesus said that this is how, this is how you're to treat each other. If I, where I'm your servant, I'm your master and Lord, would do this. This is serious, folk. This is very, very important that we get this. I know we've got it. You've got it already. But I love the image of service. It's so beautiful. He took the towel and washed their feet. And he said, this is what I want you to do with each other, to wash each other's feet, to lift each other up, to lift each other up. See how they love each other. They said of the early church. I went to a wedding uh, two summers ago. Friends of our mine got married, Ben and Ashley. And I was surprised because halfway through the service, they did this. They washed each other's feet. And I'm thinking, man, this is a wedding. What are you doing? You got dirty feet. You can smell them from here. No. They understood that marriage was about washing each other's feet. And that's what we do here at All Nations. We care for each other. We lift each other up. This is our main objective. We care for each other. We put aside our own complaints and our, our complexities. Man, I'm complex. Just wait till I tell you about my life. Put aside our complexities and our, and our hurts and our pains. Offer them to Jesus. And then we lift the towel. like a, We put a towel on our waist. This is who we are. We serve each other in love. And the third image I want to bring to you is the cross, of course. The point of exchange. He died for us. That we would have liberty and freedom and we'd have heaven. We give him our sin at the cross. We give him our brokenness, our burdens. We give him our very lives. We give our lives to the Lord. True north. True north. And free. Isn't that true? He gave me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You know, there's a painting in Paris in the Louvre. And you can't distinguish what it is. You can't see it. You can't understand it. It's all confused. It's all, what is this painting? Is it modern art? But then the, the sign says, kneel, and you will see. So you get down before the painting, and you look up at it. And you see it's Jesus on the cross. And the only way you can see Jesus on the cross is to kneel before him. The only way is to humble yourself before the Lord, and he will lift you up in due time. Thank you, Lord. The yoke, the towel, and the cross. It's not difficult all it takes is to say, I am here, Lord. Speak.